Could it be possible there's someone who knows more about the weather than Tom Skilling? Well, we're talking about Tom's lifelong friend and mentor. They met while tracking storms. <laughs> Tom using fax machines and paper maps. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was standard fare in most <laughs> weather offices of the land. We've come a long way since then. Guys, when I was a meteorology major at the University of Wisconsin in Madison back in the early 1970s, we in most weather offices tracked storms using fax machines and paper Paper maps, no fancy equipment back then outside uh, places like the University of Wisconsin. That's where I met Dr. Louis Uccellini. Now, the name may sound familiar to you. My fellow classmate rose through the ranks and ultimately headed up our nation's premier weather service, the National Weather Service, a position he took in 2013 and held until retiring at just the end of last year. Now that Louis has a little more time on his hands, we hit the road together and headed back to a place near and dear to both of our hearts, a place we left five decades ago. And you may be surprised to learn that our alma mater, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, is the birthplace of satellite meteorology. This ought to be a lot of fun, Tom. Here we go, Louie. Yep, yep. I'll, I'll tell you, it will be a lot of yep. fun. Exactly. This ought to be fun. <laughs> All right, guys, here we go. When I wake up in the morning, love And the sunlight hurts my eyes I would point at the clouds before I could even talk, like, you know, I was, <laughs> I was interested in what was going on around me. Yeah. When Louis Uccellini left his Long Island home in 1968, headed for Wisconsin, he had no idea where the road would take him. In fact, some thought it was a dead end. And the first thing this guy said, was you ought to go look for another another field is there's there's no future in meteorology Jeez. or something like that i arrived on campus two years later you know what in-state tuition was back in 1968 i know it was 220 dollars when i was going yeah, what was a, it hundred dollars hundred dollars <laughs> and the world's all right with me we rolled into town on a frigid February day. God, look how it's frozen over. Oh, this looks familiar. This is very familiar now. Yeah, so this is where my first class was right there. Isn't that yeah. something? I had German over there. As college students, a gravitational pull led us here. Welcome to Madison. Hey, this brings back memories, huh, Louie, of the cold winter days uh, outside a trip hall here? <laughs> it didn't seem as cold when we were younger, no, it that's didn't. for sure. I know. <laughs> I think our age is showing a bit. <laughs> cold weather never bothered Louie. I always remember being interested in snow. Louie, just think, 54 years ago, did you have any idea that you would become the director of the National Weather Service. I no, mean, was that even no. on the radar scope? No, when I got here, my goal was to get an undergraduate degree and then figure out what I was going to do with it. We had some options in the mid-20th century. Atmospheric science in Madison was brewing like a spring thunderstorm. UW scientist Dr. Werner Sumi wanted to observe the weather from space. He developed instruments, the earliest attached to Explorer 7, a satellite launched by NASA in 1959. After multiple upgrades and a few more missions in orbit, satellite meteorology was born in the middle of the dairy state. Arguably, what has gone on in this campus has revolutionized the whole field of meteorology. Yeah, and we were here at the right time. Across campus, the heavy equipment hints at even heavier science happening under the roof of the university's Space Science and Engineering Center. It's where Louis did the bulk of his graduate studies. Oh, there we go. Oh, thank you, sir. Inside, UW scientists process and distribute their real-time data to researchers and forecasters all over the world. The images are out of this world. This is the birthplace of satellite meteorology, which has just revolutionized uh, the whole field of meteorology. I mean, it's amazing. And Louis integrated the data sets from this into the computer models, which help us forecast the weather. This is what you're going to drive into. I know. Thanks, Louis. The current technology is nothing like what was in place back in our day. This is a young Louis pulling a weather map from a fax machine. We worked the maps, collected the maps, 
and then hung the maps up on a wall like this. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we came in here and we actually worked the plotting of the data. We did. This is the way you started seeing the atmosphere in motion, was doing everything by hand. It was just absolutely incredible. And now, you know, as you can tell, Maps aren't hanging on the wall. No, technology <laughs> has passed us by, Louis, yeah. I'll tell you. Louis, you were head, uh, one of, what, 16 uh, National Weather Service directors. This is what an exclusive club you're in. That's a service that touches everybody in the country every day, and, it's, and people have come to rely on it for their safety. The director of the National Weather Service is tasked with building better, faster, computational weather models. You're gonna get a 16-day forecast in the next two and a half hours. In his 13 years at the agency, and in the years prior to that that he spent at NASA, the now 72-year-old helped advance the hard science. But for Louis, it was also about the people. So there's a recognition that just providing a forecast and warning is not enough. People's lives depend on it. Louis calls it the Weather Ready Nation program, and it's a benchmark of his public service. Now they're mobilizing in front of landfalling hurricanes a week before to the day of landfall and then beyond. It's really remarkable to see how this has evolved. What's been remarkable is watching my mentor and friend ascend to the very top of our field. Oh. Think about you know, we wanted to do this as kids. I know. That we've both gotten to live our dreams. We have. Uh, you know, he's a nice man. There are no errors about Louis. Uh, it's just like when we used to gather in these math rooms. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from him, listening to him. You know, I'd ask questions. Louis, what does this mean? And what does that mean? And he was always good about telling me. But um, he loves snow from the youth. He's written. Oh, he's done amazing things. He looked at the space, he worked at NASA for a while, the Space Shuttle Challenger mm -hmm. disaster, looked at the wind field into which that was launched, that spacecraft that later blew up with Krista McAuliffe yeah. on board. We're gonna do a story on that one of these days too. But he's a remarkable scientist, uh, and it was fun to get together. The information in those two brains, oh, oh my, my goodness. His brain, I'll tell oh. you, Louis is a genius, he really is, and it, it was a pleasure to have a it's chance a to highlight story, him Tom. and introduce him yeah, to our nice, audience. Two nice, smart guys, and we got to watch you guys <laughs> in action together again. It was fun. It was fun <laughs> to see Louis. He's, uh, he's a joy. Anyway, guys, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for sharing. Thank you. You bet.